It's amazing that explaining life's immense diversity All comes down to some genetics and some biochemistry And life on earth is just one family And what's true for you is true for all biology Hello and welcome to Genetic Shambles. I'm Robin Ince and this is a brand new 12 part series we're making at the Cosmic Shambles Network in conjunction with the Genetics Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution at the University of Bath. New episodes will go out every second Wednesday at 8.30pm and a good amount of them will be live so you'll be able to get involved as well and ask questions on the live stream. We're going to be using the latest research surrounding the current COVID-19 pandemic as a starting point before looking out at the past, present and future of the study of genetics. I'm going to be talking to some of the world leaders in the field to ask grand questions like why do viruses affect some people more than others? What have we learned from the Human Genome Project? And what does the future hold for genetic research in both the scientific and ethical sense? You'll be able to watch each episode first and exclusively here on the Cosmic Shambles Network, either on our YouTube channel or at cosmicshambles.com slash genetic shambles, or listen to an audio podcast edition one week later on the Genetics Unzipped podcast from the Genetics Society and hosted by Dr. Kat Arney. Our first episode a few weeks ago featured a live COVID-19 Q&A with top experts. And in today's episode, we're going to look at how our understanding of previous viruses and epidemics can help us get to grips with COVID-19. First up, a conversation with Dr. Emma Hodcroft from the University of Basel in Switzerland. Her past research was on phylogenetics and the simulation of HIV. And she now works with the Next Strain team tackling the genetics of COVID-19. Hello. Hello, Emma. Hello, Robin. Very nice to be here today. Now, we, I've got loads of questions which you are things that you will know uh, and are probably the, almost the first things that you ever, ever research. So I apologize for in, in many ways their simplicity. But I think at the moment, as people are trying to understand what's going on with the pandemic, there's a lot of terminology, which is everyday use by you. But of course, mm-hmm. when they see it, they don't entirely understand. So I'm going to first of all, your your work and I think your PhD research was in phylogenetics. So when you say phylogenetics, mm-hmm. What do we mean by that? So the easiest way to think of it is making a family tree of organisms. But because clearly most viruses and animals aren't kind enough to report back to us, you know, who their parents were and who their grandparents were, we do this by looking at the genetics of the organisms instead. So whenever, for example, in pathogens, this is an easy example. Whenever a virus replicates in your body, there's a chance that it will make a little mistake when it does that. And this is the best way to think of it is a typo. So just like in a document, if we had a couple of small typos, you could probably still read the document. And the same is true for viruses. They usually don't change how the virus behaves at all. But if we have two viruses that have the same typos, we can assume that they're probably closely related. They probably both got those typos from their parent or from a parent somewhere back in time. And so what we do when we do phylogenetics Genetics is we look for those little typos and we match up viruses that have the same ones and we create essentially a virus family tree. And this helps us relate all the different viruses that are circulating in the world, like in the new coronavirus at the moment. And then we can help to understand how it's spread and how its different dynamics have behaved over time. So that's what phylogenetics is. So thinking of that, some of your early work was with HIV. And from what I remember of first reading about that, I, I remember reading Steve Jones's book where he talked about the fact that it also proves Darwinian ideas of, of, of evolution. When you watch that, you do see it in action. Anyone who says you can't watch evolution. But but the HIV was quite a rapidly mutating virus, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so HIV is one of the fastest evolving viruses. And this is where actually where a lot of phylogenetics work started or where it really took off is because in the early days of kind of sequencing, sequencing was hard and it was expensive. And so we could often only get kind of short parts of the virus, not the whole genome, but just a little chunk in the middle. 
And for a lot of viruses, if you just take a few hundred bases, it'll look the same from virus to virus because the chance that a mutation's happened in that short little chunk is much smaller. But in HIV, it actually evolves so rapidly that even if you just have a few hundred bases, you can see those changes. And so HIV gave us the kind of the first opportunity that we could take these small chunks that we were able to get at the time and able to afford to get at the time, and we could still see how the virus was evolving, not only between people, but actually within people because it evolves that quickly. Now, as technology has improved, we're able to get the whole virus genome so we can catch every single typo, every single mutation that happens. And now we're able to expand out to viruses that mutate more slowly, like the new coronavirus. So it's, it's in some ways, it's an evolutionary advantage to be very poor at exact replication. But I presume there's a balance between being so, so. So with something like HIV, which I certainly remember as being being a, a teenager in the 80s, you know, it was it was a very terrifying and 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 strange time uh, filled with both misinformation as well as information. But it's 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 shabbiness at replication in some ways is its advantage as well. Exactly. So so this is definitely as you say, it's a bit of a balancing act because when the virus is having a lot of these typos, a lot of these mutations, because it's, as you say, a little bit sloppy in its replication, on the one hand, there's a good chance that a lot of these mutations don't do anything or they actually hurt the virus. It's much easier to break something than to improve it. But because you're exploring every type of mutation so quickly, you also have a better chance of happening to hit upon one that helps you, that is an advantage to how quickly you can replicate, or in the case of HIV, how effectively you can avoid the host immune system, which is exactly what HIV, what makes HIV such a, a terrible disease, is that it actually explores enough mutations that it finds the ones that trick your body into not recognizing it, which is why you can't get some kind of immunity. But yes, it's always a balance because in the course of that, HIV also has lots of mutations that actually damage it. And those ones just fail. They don't go on and make any more viruses. But it on the, on the overall, it has quite a successful outcome with these few that end up better. So with, with COVID-19, from again, from sort of the very basic reading I've done, that, that one of the advantages with that is that it is perhaps reasonably stable in terms. Uh, so is, is, is that is that current? I know, of course, we're, things are moving all the time, but is that currently what, what, what we believe? Well, so it's still faster than, for example, animals or bacteria mutate. But for a virus, it's definitely, it's nowhere near where HIV is. And it's even slower than flu. So we aren't in this territory where this is something that is evolving so quickly, it's able to kind of outsmart your immune system, like I just described for HIV. It's considerably slower than that, which is why we aren't terribly worried about mutations at the moment. So for example, as I said earlier, in HIV, if you look inside someone, they actually have many different variants of HIV because it's mutating so quickly. We can actually see those differences in the person. When you look into someone who has coronavirus, you might still find a few variants, but in general, people don't experience a bunch of mutations while they have the virus. This is something that happens over multiple people and over a much longer time scale. So this is something that, this is why, even though there's been a lot of media around, oh, the virus is mutating and we're really worried about it, the scientists actually are not very worried. It's mutating at a very kind of normal rate for a virus, exactly the rate we would expect for a coronavirus. And in the short term, we don't think there's anything to be concerned about with these mutations. So the the work that you're doing, I mean, it, it does seem that uh, within in your world, an enormous number of people basically dropped tools on everything else and have turned to working on COVID nineteen. So so was there a point where I've certainly spoken to people at the Crick Institute, etc. It's like right, everything else is off. This is now what we're working on. Do you, I mean this this seems in one way to be a very positive image of of science, uh, which is saying right, we need to get to work. Yeah, so this is interesting, actually, because I think that this is both a positive thing, but it also shows some of the shortcomings in how we execute public health and scientific research. So I do think it's amazing that so many scientists have been able to turn so quickly, you know, at basically no notice and dedicate all of their time and research to the new coronavirus. And I think this is very much why we've been able to move so fast. I mean, we have done, we've learned so much about this virus that we didn't even know existed six months ago. The, the pace of research has been amazing. But on the flip side of that, 
most people, now it's changed a little bit, but particularly in the early months, most people who were working on this virus were not actually funded to work on this virus because of course it didn't exist. And so a lot of people were kind of switching just based on interest and based on this was the right thing to do. So we have a virus that's causing a lot of trouble. If you can help, you should help. But a lot of people ended up working kind of I don't want to say unpaid, but without the money from grants that is actually supposed to go to this research. So they're pulling money out of other projects or they're just doing this kind of out of the goodwill of their hearts. They're maybe paying out of their own pockets or their own lab funds for reagents and, and equipment and staff to do this research. Now, it's great that some were able to do that, but many weren't. We had a lot of scientists who were otherwise ready to do things like start sequencing the virus, but they didn't have funds. And then also in the bigger picture, I think we have to ask ourselves, do we really want our, our global pandemic response to be based upon the goodwill of scientists who aren't technically funded to do this? And this really speaks a lot to the, the kind of divide there is between academic research, which can do this kind of pivoting and can is kind of at the forefront of research, and then public health, which has the kind of longer term funding, but often doesn't have really close tie-ins to the latest technology, and often is, is rather tied down by bureaucracy and how quickly it can switch. And I think we could do a lot of bridge building there that could give us a better pandemic response that wouldn't depend on everyone kind of voluntarily dropping th dropping everything else and, and jumping into something else. It's very nice that it happens, but I'm not sure that's what we want to be depending on. Right. The, um, now, what you're working on, and, and this is people are beginning to see more about this, is within the world of next strain. So yes. What uh, can you can you tell me what your work involves and, and what was the kind of the, the, the inspiration and the development of this project? Yeah, so NextRain was was founded in early 2015 by Richard Nair here at the University of Basel and Trevor Bedford, who's at the Fred Hutch Cancer Institute in Seattle. And what it originally started was started to do was to track influenza. So using phylogenetics, as I talked about earlier, they wanted to see if we could better understand, you know, how does flu travel around the world? We have different flu seasons, you know, in the winter of the southern hemisphere, the winter of the northern hemisphere, different dynamics in the tropics, and of course, many seasons we have a different flu strain circulating than we had last year, which is why we keep getting the flu every year and we need new flu vaccines. So they wanted to know if we could start gathering sequences from around the world and use phylogenetics to better understand how is flu changing? And in particular, can we predict the next strain of flu so that we can pick a better vaccine? And this is actually still a lot of the work that we do, even though it's not the part that is getting us in the news at the moment, but it's still really important. Now, as, as uh, the software evolved and the methodology evolved, we started expanding this out to other pathogens. So we've also worked on Zika, Ebola, um, lesser known pathogens like enterovirus, which is what I worked on before. And then in January, we were very lucky that we were able to quickly pivot to this new coronavirus. And it was really exciting to be able to do this so early because those first sequences were released so quickly in January. So in early January, we were able to plot the new coronavirus sequences in the larger coronavirus family and show that they were kind of related to SARS-1, but not direct descendants and not part of SARS-1. They were slightly different. And then we actually set up a dedicated build for the new coronavirus on January 21st. And in the beginning, this was, you know, 5, 10, 20 sequences. We now have over 40,000 sequences and we're running builds that are about 5,000. We have to downsample that. It's just too big. But we run seven builds for different regions of the world every day that are about four to 5,000 sequences each. So it's been quite a ride. But I think that we're really lucky that we were able to pivot to this so quickly in January and have been able to provide this service for these months. So in terms of... of working out the next strain and the working out the possibilities with, with something like COVID-19 it seems sometimes it requires you know human action or poor human decisions in terms of what we you know a lot of people will will, will blame this in terms of of eating things that shouldn't really be part of our pattern of eating for instance mm -hmm. so when you're working out at what point you're able to go this is probably the development of various different strains of things but its moment where it crosses from one species to another is the bit where it becomes uh, more predictively difficult. Does that make yes. sense as a question? Yeah, so, so trying to figure out when a pathogen might jump is always difficult because we really have 
so little idea of what's circulating in animals. There are some projects that try and go out and sample bats, sample pangolins, sample civets and all sorts of animals to find out what viruses are circulating in them. But it's huge. I mean, we, we know, you know, even just probably a small fraction of viruses that are in humans, never mind how many are circulating in different species of animal. And then it's very hard to understand which one of these might be best primed to jump into humans. So this is something that's gotten a lot of attention with the new coronavirus. Different animals have slightly different um, kind of locks on the outside of their cell, which is what the virus uses to get in. But it has to have a matching key to get into that lock. So you might be very well adapted to get into the lock of bat cells, but then you're going to have to make a change to be able to effectively get into human cells. And different animals allow this at different rates. So pigs, for example, in flu are kind of a famous example of flu that adapts to pigs is often a little bit kind of primed to jump into humans. But we don't know all of the animals in the world that are, you know, particularly good kind of hosts for things that then might jump into humans. And exactly how this happens and how this, you know, where the opportunities arise for a virus to change so that it can infect some other animal and then change again so it can infect humans. It's all very stochastic and it's hard to know when it might happen next. See, I, f I found that fascinating. I was talking to Kat Hobater, who is uh, um, based at St. Andrews, and she has, actually is a, a primatologist, and she works with chimpanzees in Uganda. And she was saying that one of the major issues at the moment is not merely that they can't travel and, and make sure that uh, everything is, is, is good in that reserve, but also the fact that they, they are not unable to communicate with uh, gorillas, with chimpanzees, etc., for fear of uh and that to me is a very interesting that bit as you were just talking about that part of the tree which connects different species and which says that some species will that the, the key and the lock will never match mm -hmm. and others like she was even saying with things like you know coughs and colds are very dangerous to to uh, a gorilla and i found that a fascinating part of trying to understand mutation heredity and natural selection in action with something like this Yes, no, it's really interesting. And it's also been interesting in the new coronavirus. I certainly wouldn't say that we understand it completely. But for example, we've seen that it seems like some pets have acquired this from humans. We've had the tiger in New York who seemed to have gotten it from their keepers. We've had a few cases of house cats. One dog, we don't know if that was an outlier or not, and then a whole selection of minks that were being farmed in the Netherlands. There seems to have been back and forth transmission from human to mink and back to human again. So we're certainly still learning about exactly all of the animals that seem to be susceptible to this particular variant of coronavirus. Now, uh, while we're talking about other animals, I'm going to move it all the way to the uh, Drosophila because that always interests me. And I know that you, like many people in, in your discipline, have, have done. Just uh, why, what is it? about that fly that makes it so useful to you? <laughs> so I am not a Drosophila geneticist myself. I did a bit of work with them, but but I'm certainly not going to be able to give the huge fanfare that I know my friends who work in Drosophila would. In general, it's because we understand so much about it. It has a relatively simple genome, at least compared to some organisms, and we've had it sequenced for a really long time. So that means we've been able to do work understanding the genetics of Drosophila, understanding which genes do which. It also is a, it's a great organism to study development development because you can actually look at the at the egg and then it turns into a little a little caterpillar thing and then it goes into a pupa and then it comes out as a fly we can use dyes and markers to show different cells and different receptors happening at different times and of course this happens in a nice time frame of a couple of weeks unlike for example humans or larger mammals where this can take a lot longer and because it's outside of the of the mother it's in these little eggs and these and these little caterpillars we can observe it directly and they have a pretty simple life cycle as well. They're easy to keep in small tubes with essentially kind of some yeast banana food. So they were very um, just useful and kind of convenient for early labs as well, as far as the number you could keep and how easy they were to, to handle. But now they're really just one of the organisms we understand the best in terms of development and genetics. They're not excellent for studying what I do, which is human pathogens. <laughs> so, and in terms of your sense of life on earth your understanding of, of 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 life on earth how does that change working in this discipline how does as as, as we were talking about before we start recording this you know this this uh, you are seeing evolution in action you are seeing and, and has that do you think changed you in terms of your your sense of, of what life on earth is i think it certainly has changed my ideas of how humans interact and how 
how much our lives are shaped and influenced by pathogens. And I certainly, I feel like there's many people that study more pathogens who could give even more insight into this for things like, for example, leprosy and tuberculosis that have been shaping human history really for, for much, much longer than, than recent things like HIV. But when you start out, for example, studying something like HIV, it can seem very simple. You know, you're studying a virus on a computer, you're looking at its evolution, but there's so much more around this kind of socially, um, you know, economically, there's so many levels and everything is a little bit more complicated than you think. It, I think it's a misconception, for example, when you first go into HIV research, it can all seem really simple. We just need to tell people to use protection, to get on PrEP, to take their drugs regularly. Why haven't we you know, defeated this disease yet? But of course, on the ground, these stories are much different. There's a lot of problems with stigma. There's the problem of people accessing testing, feeling comfortable. How do we get these medicines to a lot of places? In, in a lot of areas of Africa, we have the medicine. It's just that getting it to small villages and earning the trust of people and having the local kind of people on the ground who are educated and willing to be the ambassadors to go out and convince people that this is a good idea. That's where these roadblocks are. It's beyond the science, which I think is humbling as a scientist when it often feels like like we just need to figure out the right equations, the right biology, the right molecules, and we've solved the problem. It's often much bigger than that. And I think coronavirus is a good example here. We understand a lot of the science, but a lot of what's hindered us in containing this virus is not the science directly often. It's getting that into a political and a cultural response that people can follow and the governments are willing to implement. Because we, we knew early on at least some of the steps to take to stop the virus, and it was more the kind of political will and the social acceptability of doing things like closing restaurants or having a lockdown. That was what made the difference, even though um, we, you know, more science not necessarily would have, would have changed that. So I think studying pathogens, it just gives you quite an interesting idea of how much of all of this interacts and how it is much more than just the pathogen. It really is a political and it is kind of a, a social and demographic thing that influences this much more than the, or much more than just the biology does. I think that's why a lot of the physicists that I work with, I think that's why they stay with physics is because once you've got a certain number of equations about particle behavior, you might still have spooky action from a distance, all manner of strangeness in quantum entanglement and uh, a holographic universe, but it's still more likely you'll be able to narrow that down than manage to master <laughs> human behavior across exactly. any group bigger than five. It's as soon as you get people in there, that's, that's when it gets confusing. <laughs> And it seems, I mean, technologically now at the moment, and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the computational power that is, is behind, you know, this simulation, does this give you uh, a greater sense of optimism, the speed of technological change, the speed in which you are able to, I mean, I would imagine most of it, the impossibility if we if we think back to obviously the Spanish in, uh, flu of the, uh, after the, uh, uh, the First World War, the tools that you have now, seem to me to be quite remarkable when we compare what we had a hundred years ago. I would say that they're remarkable even compared to what we had during the first, you know, the SARS-1 epidemic. What we're doing now would have been absolutely unthinkable even a few short years ago, which has been incredible for me just because in the course of my, my, my scientific life that I've been working on pathogens, what we've been able to do has absolutely exploded. Things that were theoretical when I started my PhD, we can now do. And this is in part both to computational advances, but also just to sequencing, you know, getting as many sequences as we're able to get now reliably when I started kind of, you know, in, the, in 2008, 2009, this was something that was a big roadblock. Sequencing was just not that easy and it just was really expensive. So you, you, you invested in it very, very, very carefully and it had you know, a lot of caveats as far as reliability and how much you might be able to get. And so it was, it was still revolutionizing science then, but I feel like we've really crossed a threshold in the past few years as far as not only how cheap and how easy it is, but how accessible it is with things like the, the nanopore, which is a tiny sequencer about the size of a chocolate bar that you can plug into a computer and you can do sequencing almost in the wild. You know, we can send it to places in Africa where there's no way we would ever get a huge kind of traditional sequencer. This has allowed people to set up sequencing and learn how to sequence things faster and cheaper than ever. And this means that we're able to, to 
in theory and, and almost in practice with this coronavirus, set up a real global sequencing network. And I think the possibilities for this are so exciting. We've always been limited in the past few years by where we get our samples from. Not surprisingly, most of them come from the US and Europe. And then there's you know countries like China, which do pretty well. But there's huge areas of the world where we have no idea what, what you know the virus that we're studying is doing there because it's just too hard for, for sequencing to be a, an affordable an accessible option. Now we're getting to the point where if we can get the training in, we can educate, you know, train people who know how to do this, we can get these basic sequencers out there, we can start really collecting global information on pathogens. And particularly for the ones that we generally think of as a little more boring, but the ones that come back every year, like the common cold viruses that cause that rhinovirus and terovirus and coronavirus, we could potentially learn so much about how viruses transmit if we were able to paint a global picture of where do these viruses go when they're not affecting us in Europe and America? What do they do? What demographics do they infect? We could learn so much that then might be really useful to apply when we have outbreaks like this pandemic. And I'm personally incredibly excited to be on the verge of being able to do this kind of daily routine sequence analysis where we can really start getting to the bottom of some of this virus behavior. I did an event with those people who'd been developed. I think they're based in Oxford, the nanopore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just incredible when they were showing the, the uh, I mean, that, that, as you said, that this is part of, I think, what is a, a very beautiful thing, which is seeing this connectivity that is occurring as well. Seeing that, as you said, that possibility where this seems to me another moment where we're seeing research and technology where hopefully borders are being chipped away at and that, and that, seems to me to be if, if not optimistic to use the Hans Rosling thing possibilistic it's a kind of it's a possibilism that can give us some heart I hope Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and I also think there's a real chance for kind of global equity here, kind of equality in the science. We have a chance here to make up for some of the behavior in the past that we've had as scientists, which, which hasn't been great. So helicopter science is often a term that's used when researchers from westernized countries like the US and Europe fly to Africa kind of as the saviors, take a bunch of samples of some disease, fly them back to wherever, do the analysis and, you know, fax the results back. Here's what you need to do that's not the best way to do science. We need to be empowering countries to be able to do this themselves, making sure that they have the experts trained, they have the resources. And with things like MinION and the ease of training and the kind of portability of this, we have the chance to not have other countries rely on Western countries for these services and not be kind of usurping that science to, to Western countries, but instead enabling those countries to execute this themselves and then be key players in the scientific community where they also have sequences, knowledge and analysis to contribute rather than being just the place where we go to get the sequences ourselves. And I think that's great. I, I really hope we can continue down this path so that the whole scientific community can be that little bit more equal. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. I, at the moment I said Spanish flu, I went, what on earth are you talking about? It's 1919. A lot's happened since then. Uh, I'm sure once you reach middle age, you see, it's terrible. The uh, But thank you very much, Dr. Emma Hodcroft. It's really... Uh, I just find that that I, I think one of the things that I find most beautiful is when I think of some of the writings that came out of the 19th century, some of the kind of predictive, hopeful, you know, you think of when you read Darwin and there's a lot of maybes. And I think that possibly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was always very, very careful with his, his language to, to offer no no definites. And I just think now that bit where sometimes you have a discipline that's that's waiting for the technology and it can only say, OK, well, this is how I think it's going to work, but we still haven't got the machine that does it. And now it seems that in terms of our uh, a, a, a new deep level of understanding of, of what the, the nature of, of evolution is. Oh, definitely. No, I, I would completely agree. I think that this is such an exciting time to be in this field. And I mean, I think that we've had an example of this right now. For years, we've been talking about the theoretical idea of real-time tracking of pathogen evolution with real-time sequences coming to us to help us track a pandemic. We've been able to do that a little bit with flu, but in general, mostly sequencing is, is just, it's you know, I don't want to say it's slow because it's faster than it was a few years ago, but if you're talking about a pandemic, 
pandemic, even being delayed by four or five months, it's too much to act on that information. We're very often looking retrospectively at what happened in the past rather than what can we do right now. With this new pandemic, as, as terrible as it is, we've actually been able to demonstrate that yes, you can do this. We can have real time genomic understanding of a totally novel, novel virus weeks after it's first appeared. And then in those months, we can track it in real time as it spreads around the world. That's incredible. If, if you told people that we would be doing this 10 years ago, I think they would have laughed. But we've shown that it's possible. And I think this is something that, you know, we can continue to break down these, these maybes, as you say, we can make these possibilities that are really happening in the world. And that's incredibly exciting. Dr. Emma Hodcroft, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robin. Next, I spoke with Professor Samunia Permahamid, a clinical pharmacologist and geneticist and the NHS Chair of Pharmacogenetics at the University of Liverpool. I wanted to talk to him about how the development of previous vaccines might be able to help us as we search for drugs to help us beat COVID-19. We were going to start off just with some, some simple definitions, I suppose, for, for a lot of people. It's, it's language they don't know. So, so for someone who works in pharmacology, what should people know? What is pharmacology? Pharmacology is the study of drugs uh, and drugs, how they work, how they're handled by the body. Um, and, and it goes from really it's from the molecular aspects right through to actually undertaking clinical trials. So it's very broad. It's not disease focused, but it's really looking at the medicines, how they're handled by the body, how they sort of uh, act on the body and what effect they have in terms of both producing good effects curing diseases, but also bad effects in terms of causing side effects. And in terms of the work that can exist now, looking at it at a genetic level, what, what, are, what are the, the possibilities that have opened up there? So as you know, as everybody knows, that the Human Genome Project was perhaps the biggest advance that's been made uh, in science to date. Um, and, and that has provided us with a huge amount of information in terms of the variability that exists within the human population. Um, we know that when we pro produce, give drugs to people, um, uh, we know that drugs don't always work uh, in, in, in different people. And uh, we also know drugs sometimes cause side effects. Um, and we know that genetic factors play a role in determining whether a drug might work well in a particular person or whether a drug might cause side effects in another person. And that's called the area of pharmacogenomics. But, but what, what the genome also has provided us is with the knowledge that you can actually start to identify, use the genetic knowledge to develop new drugs or um, develop, uh, use existing drugs for new indications, for new disease areas. And the second aspect is called drug repurposing. The first aspect where you actually using genetics to identify new drugs is called drug discovery and drug development. So looking at, in, in the history of vaccinations, in, in, and now if we look at the 21st century, how it is changing for all the people currently working around the world in so many different institutions. What are they now, what are the tools they are now able to use and the approaches they can have when looking at a vaccination for something like COVID-19? So, so if for vaccination, so for infectious disease, what you can do now is to sequence very quickly. And the Chinese researchers were able to do that very quickly at the beginning of COVID in, in Wuhan. They were able to put the data online and it was available to the whole scientific community. And that was the key uh, uh, issue that led to the sort of work that's been going on all around the world with the many different vaccines which are in development. Um, that key aspect of sequencing, putting that online um, and being able to show what are the key determinants, where the antigens might be uh, for us to be able to then develop vaccine was, 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 was really important. Uh, of the researchers in China to be able to put that online. Now, you're, you're part of uh, an international group that, that uh, basically came up with five principles that you felt were very important in the approaches to, to COVID-19 and, and more broadly than that, I would say, but that's specifically what you're looking at. So I wonder if we could look at each principle and, and why they come into play and perhaps look a little bit historically as well. Uh, uh, first one, the first uh, the five principles, the drug must work against the virus in cells or animal models at doses which are relevant for humans. So where are the lessons that we've learned? I presume that that also will come from some of the, some of the errors of the past. Yeah, so... so Obviously, when you start looking at a drug and developing a new drug, you usually start in the test tube and usually start using cells 
um, and sales act as models. But what works in a cell may not necessarily work uh, in a in a preclinical model, such as an animal uh, model, uh, and may not work in man at all. So you know, to go from a cellular system right through straight into man might mean that you know you end up with a lot of false positives, and you may end up with you know spending a lot of money but not get a drug at the end of it. So what we set up was those principles to say, well, you know, l uh, do the work in cellular systems um, and make sure that you're doing it at concentrations which are relevant to uh, where the disease is going to be in man, um, and then utilize those uh, that data to be able to devise a good dosing strategy for using in man. So, for example, um, with COVID-19, let's take that as an example. Uh, if you have a drug um, and, you know, it, it, it gets to a good level in the bloodstream, um, but actually it doesn't get into the lungs very much, it's not going to work in the lungs, which is the main site of attack with COVID-19. So when you start doing your work within the test tube in vitro, uh, then you really need to make sure that you're going to be able to get the right concentration in the right place in the body to make sure that the drug is going to work against the virus. Could, would you be able to take us through the stages where from from, from the early uh, testing to the point of clinical trial to the point where something would be seen? I'm just I'm, what I particularly found. I, I was thinking about if if we considered what would have say happened if this was happening in 1965 and what is now happening in 2020. What would the what the different stages that we are now? Okay. So, so um, I was I was I was just born in about 1965, so I can't tell you exactly what was happening at that time, but but I, I know from history. So at that time, we had very low throughput systems. We had obviously the in vitro systems, cellular systems, and so on, but the cells weren't very well characterized, which we can characterize at the moment. We didn't have the molecular biology techniques that we have now, where we can go into depth in terms of what's happening. We didn't have some of the sort of um, machines that we have, technology we have to be able to measure some of the parameters that we can measure at the moment. Um, and, and, and that is what, what has sort of, you know, transformed the way we can actually undertake a work for COVID-19. The pace of progress has been fantastic, you know, in terms of a new disease being described in, uh, you know, late December, early January, to where we are now, where vaccines are actually in early phase trials. Um, and what the, the, the kind of technologies we have now, um, you know, whereby we can completely characterize a cell line we can actually look at the amount of virus there is in there, the viral load that is in there, uh, you know, the numbers of virus uh, particles which are replicating. We can see what effect the virus is having on the cell. We can actually measure the level of the drug in different compartments. And we can then model that using many of the mathematical models which are available to see how much of the drug will be able to get into the area that you want it to get into the body to be able to attack the virus. And that information that you get from the in vitro systems, the uh, test tubes, um, so you can utilize that to be able to go to your animal model systems, but also eventually to man. Then what you do is to, to extrapolate from your data you have to identify what the right dose is going to be uh, in man. Now, if it's a very well-known drug, which has been used in man before, such as hydroxychloroquine was, then you can go straight into big phase three trials. But if it's a very new drug, you have to do early phase trials where you undertake work uh, in a small number of individuals where you take multiple blood samples and really look at the safety and tolerability of the drug. And that's called a phase one study. If the phase one study shows that that is, uh, you know, the drug is being absorbed, it's getting to the sort of, uh, bloodstream in adequate quantities and it's not causing any side effects, et cetera, or, you know, it's not causing any sort of major side effects, then you can go into phase two study, which is bigger uh, and usually involves doing it in patients who have COVID. Uh, again, uh, trying to understand the tolerability issues trying to understand how the drug uh, is handled in the body um, and how the body tolerates the drug. And if it passes through that stage, then you can go into the bigger trials where you like, like in recovery, where they've done a thousand patient trials, um, you know, where to see whether the drug is actually efficacious. So these are very sort of, you know, key steps that you have to follow. The great thing that's happening now is that we can, uh, we've been able to do some of this much more quickly than we have been able to do in the past. Now, phase one to phase three is said to be a linear process, as it was always a linear process in the past. But actually, what we've learned is that you can sometimes do it in non-linear fashion, whereby you can have phase one and phase two sometimes running, um, in, not in parallel, but but concurrently, you know, with, with sort of some overlap. And similarly with phase three as well, with, uh, with overlap. And that hopefully reduces the time span of trying to develop a drug 
from uh, getting it first into man to, to getting a product which is actually shown to work in man. Brilliant. That's that's fascinating. It, I, do, I do find I, I know it's a strange time to have optimism in some ways where we, we see. But, but this hearing the speed in terms of change of technology and understanding on so many different levels. I think this has been a very interesting time for lay people to see something of science in action, because rarely do we get this amount of science being reported. It's not, you know, it's it's so often science is not seen as a public concern, even though, of course, it is such a vital public concern. But this one, I, it's it's really interesting to see. Uh, I I I think just the speed of of the evolution of of of, of change and possibility. Absolutely, I mean, I I, I think it's been a, a, a COVID has been a, a major disaster for the world, you know. But but we can science is going to allow us to be able to fight it and come out of it with the solution. Uh, which will protect the human population. And that's a key thing. And, you know, um, I think over the last uh, four months or so, um, uh, the sort of population throughout the world, not only in the UK, has learned about R numbers, has learned about epidemiology, has learned about drug discovery, drug trials, and vaccine development. And that's happened in four months. That probably hasn't happened in the previous 40 years. Do you, in terms of, I mean, one of one of the the, the more uh, I suppose frightening elements of human psychology in the last ten to fifteen years has been the anti-vaxxer movement, and and the you know, it does seem that conspiracy theory has managed to in so many different parts of uh, attempts to understand the world. Do you have any answers when when we do hear some of these these theories come out? What do you find are the quickest routes to explain? to people perhaps a misunderstanding of where what they think is a legitimate anxiety yeah so so i, I think communication is critical here uh, obviously there are people with different views um, but it is important to understand the potential benefits uh, unfortunately every um, therapy that you give every vaccine you give may have some side effects but the you know, side effects usually are mild um, and, and it is important to understand that, but the benefits far exceed uh, the side effects. And I think it's important to, for people to understand the historical context. You know, we have eliminated smallpox because of a vaccine. Polio uh, is still present in uh, one or two countries, as far as I understand it from WHO, but, you know, that, that hopefully will be eliminated. Um, and, you know, the only sort of, um, the quick, sort of, and not the, quick is not the right word, but more rapid answer to COVID is going to be a vaccine that works. You know, although if the if the vaccines which are being developed at the moment don't work, then you know we will be in this process of having a repeated lockdowns, um, you know, and then come back in, and that's going to have a major impact uh, on uh, people's well-being, on the economy, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, and on non-COVID deaths as well. Because the more we lock down, the more so not only do we get COVID deaths and so on, but the more we get the non-COVID deaths as well. So. You know, the vaccine is a critical uh, aspect of us moving forward uh, and coming out of this particular pandemic. Um, I just want to look at, um, again, in the five principles, number three, uh, there needs to be a good understanding of how the virus infects and multiplies within the body and how this relates to the clinical features of COVID-19. Now, again, for, for people on the outside like me, a lot of people have become quite startled, I think, by what appears to be the possibility of long-term ramifications for uh, the heart and, and lungs. Um, and I know we're still at an early stage of, of, of understanding what's gone there, but how, as we, how, what do you feel about in terms of our understanding of COVID-19? Uh, I know it's very hard to predict the position we're in because it is still a changing, uh, you know, we're in a changing world in terms of the information that's out there. But how much would that kind of information change the approach to a vaccine, if at all? So we, we um, from the time the uh, first genetic sequence was posted for the virus um, and then understanding how it actually entered the cell um, and then what it did within the cell, how it multiplied, how it took over the cell has been key to understanding what kind of um, different manifestations it might cause. Obviously, clinical observation has been key in determining, you know, what kind of features it's causing. Um, and and um, having sort of seen patients with, with COVID-19, uh, also treated uh, some of them, um, but, but also having read a lot about the literature, you know, we are learning a lot about the virus in terms of the clinical manifestation causes. 
and and um, everybody I've spoken with says that they are just um, they haven't seen anything like this in terms of causing so many different manifestations affecting so many different organ systems. Um, and and you know so as you said, the lung is clearly the key organ which is involved, but we know that it can affect the liver, it can affect the heart, uh, it can affect the brain in some people, and it seems to affect um, the vessels as well and causing thrombosis. So it is affecting a lot of different organs and in different ways in different people uh, in, in terms of severity as well as organ manifestations. Um, and, and it seems to be related to the fact that the virus attaches to a receptor on the cell surface and uses that receptor uh, to be able to get into the cell where it then hijacks the machinery and, and starts replicating within the cell, which then dies and then infects another cell and so on. And that leads to the immune response, which occurs where you get in some patients, particularly those who have severe lung involvement, who require a ventilator, uh, ventilation, um, it, it causes um, a massive outpouring of cytokines, which causes inflammation and so on, which, which then uh, is, is, is responsible for the lung uh, inflammation, lung injury, which occurs, uh, which uh, then uh, requires oxygen therapy, first of all, low flow oxygen, then high flow oxygen, and eventually in some people, unfortunately, the requirement for mechanical ventilation. And hence why some of the things which are coming out showing that we need not only an antiviral, which reduces the viral application, and that's where remdesivir comes in, the new drug, uh, which has been, uh, you know, which, which, uh, which uh, has shown some good results uh, in the American trial, but also the dexamethasone, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory agent, reduces inflammation, which is what the result which came out from recovery, um, the Oxford run trial, which has been running throughout the UK. Um, and it is possible, and it is likely, in fact, and we know that from other viruses as well, that we will eventually need um, uh, combination therapy, not just one drug, possibly two, possibly three, to be able to really, really affect the um, disease severity and try to reduce any morbidity or mortality associated with this. Um, dexamethasone reduces mortality by about 30% in, in the most severely affected individuals, those who are ventilated. So therefore, it's not the complete answer. It is a part of the answer. So it's great sort of a result. But it's, it's so we need to continue doing the research to identify uh, what combinations are working, what other drugs there are out there, and how we can actually try to uh, get um, the best uh, outcomes for patients in terms of reducing their length of stay in hospital, reducing the progression to more severe forms of disease from, you know, to, uh, you know, and reducing the likelihood of ending up in the intensive care unit. And all of that um, is, 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 you know, critical to be able to look at the whole sort of process and where we can intervene uh, to be able to improve the outcomes for the patients, obviously, while we're waiting for a vaccine, and hopefully vaccine does arrive. And just finally, I wondered what what do you feel are the most useful lessons so far in terms of the uh, investigation into COVID nineteen? The most important thing I think that's happened is that we can move with speed, pace. Um, you know, it's amazing, uh, as I said, how quickly we have moved on within within four months or uh, you know within six months uh, of of uh, um, coronavirus first being discovered uh, in Wuhan. Um, and part of that has been collaboration, collaboration within uh, each country, but collaboration between countries as well. Uh, and also the interdisciplinary research. Team science, I think, has been really important. People are collaborating, you know, epidemiologists are collaborating with lab scientists, are collaborating with pharmacologists. I think that, that joint working has been really important. Also important is actually the availability of information uh, free online. Uh, you know, from the sequence that came out, first of all, uh, you know, I think that was really important, but also all the information that's coming out. People are putting their journal articles on uh, on preprint servers, such as Med Archives, uh, and anybody can access that even before it's gone to the journal. Obviously, you have to interpret those articles, uh, you know, with the degree of caution uh, and so on, read them carefully to understand whether they're, you know, what the flaws are within any kind of study which has been done, what the strengths are, and, and try to collate that information. Um, and the, and, and the, as I said, the information in journals is also being made available free. So all of that has come together, together with the technologies that we have, uh, together with the, um, uh, uh, together with the sort of actually the public being part of this as well. I think that's critical as well. You know, we can't do anything unless the people who get COVID are willing to take part in the research. So we have to thank uh, every member of the public 
who has taken part, irrespective of whether they had COVID or uh, not had COVID, um, you know, in terms of providing samples, providing sort of, you know, being, uh, being part of clinical trials, without the sort of involvement of everybody, uh, we wouldn't have got to where we are at the moment. So it is really very much not only um, team science in terms of scientists working together, but actually it's a team approach with everybody working together really to provide this, produce the solutions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was uh, tremendously enlightening. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'll be back in a fortnight with a live episode discussing the Human Genome Project with a great panel of scientists, including Dr. Adam Rutherford. Special thanks to Johnny Berliner for the theme song. And be sure to check out all the other goings on at CosmicShambles.com with our huge thanks to the Genetic Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution for supporting this series. See you next time.